I mean, in, in a way, with the, the object, which uh, might seem totally insignificant, so in the end, the only remnants, you know, because all, all our previous life, everything has been totally erased. So in a way, uh, and th this is basically like a, um, um, you know, mission that a lot of people who come from the minorities of the Middle East, you've got nothing behind you, and, and then it, it is really like up to you <coughs> to keep some kind of continuity going. And also, wh whatever means you can achieve, you know, also to give like uh, forms or, you know, some kind of resources and substance but also future generation, you know, to articulate uh, their history and their identity with. Yeah. Well, that's in my case. Uh. Yeah, I think um, maybe in relation to uh, thinking about the objects of knowledge, um, I think in, in my practice, perhaps I can kind of um, answer it through thinking about the landscape, the traces, the entities, the vegetation, um, and particularly, I think, the context in which the, we encounter them. And I think that context um, is something that I find really interesting because of um, how it might be seen. It's a question that I ask myself, how it might be seen by an Israeli audience or by an international audience, uh, by a Palestinian audience, etc. And trying to kind of navigate between these different readings and different interpretations. So these objects of knowledge, i.e. carriers of knowledge, right? And how do we access that knowledge? I think it's really important um, in how to hopefully unpack some of it when it's, when it's um, subjected to such um, divisive language and appropriation. Mm -hmm. I hope that answers the question. Um, <laughs> yeah, I could be with that. I, um, I, I mean, I've written a lot about the film because it was also part of PhD, so I did do quite a lot of writing about it, but I also have done a couple of papers around this project in relationship to the archives, so the stone as the archive, and the stone is the carrier. And obviously, even though the stone, the, the material, materiality bits kind of moved, which is why it's quarries of wandering form, in a way, somehow it's still there to register, and maybe that's the only kind of retrieval of this memory of this, you know, kind of expropriated landscape. So, yeah, I think the material force is very, very powerful, can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. <coughs> mm. I have a question for Dana. Um, regarding your, your work, which I thought was uh, very beautiful and uh, also came alive when you were talking about it to explain some things which cannot readily be seen in, in the images which can seem quite empty or, or like the landscape is uh, barren. Um, so I wonder how it is uh, exhibited and whether um, there are texts accompanying images and also why is there a choice of perhaps not putting in the captions the um, the locations where these are taken and whether that was indeed a choice or why? Thank you. That, yeah, that's a, that's a really important question actually and I think something that is um, still uh, in process, let's say. I haven't exhibited this work yet mm -hmm. but it is, uh, it's, it's a really important question that has been sort of carried through my practice throughout and I think um, and I've addressed it in different ways I think I'm trying to bring more text work into this in the past I've also um, did sound uh, pieces that uh, in fact maybe echo a bit more how I present the work I hear I like here because um, I think there's always been a gap between the work presented uh, without these narratives uh, and without the unpacking of these layers um, and because of the slipperiness of how they might be read, um, I've been trying to incorporate more text works um, in, into the presentation of the work. So for me, yeah, it's sort of a, it's an ongoing process in a way. The photograph seems to be the kind of uh, first thing that I do, I go out and photograph, and then I think over a long time I work with these images and how to sort of almost like peel or like uh, open up this process uh, process of, of making I mean the photograph you know is taken very quickly in a fraction of a, of a moment but but working with that image and unpacking these layers is something that I work uh, on for a much longer time <coughs> and, um, and try to sort of yeah bring in the context um, 
and also watch out that it's not too slippery. I think that happens as well. I, mean, I think I have my work uh, misread in the past, and I think that's something that I'm always conscious of. I think that's a really good question for all of you, actually, <laughs> because the, you've been, it's, it, we've had a fantastic context here. So how do you translate it when you show the work? How do I translate? Well, the, the, how do you create the context? Mm. Or do you, or so I, 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 yeah, I mean, I kind of, so White Old is a film, 60 minutes, and it's in its long-form film um, version. And um, I did, I remember, I did actually at one point have a series of panels at the very end, which gave some information about particularly the brother, you know, Ramsey and the brother, what they were doing now, for instance, like the brothers are no longer in the quarry, lots of things have happened to them, some very difficult. And um, I remember Yazid Anani, who... Um, uh, um, a kind of curator in Palestine. He he was at the, one of the first screenings in Nuremberg with me, which is where I was teaching or about Palestine in Nuremberg. As a Jew, it was completely nice. <laughs> <coughs> Thanks to Heike. Um, um And he 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 and Ray both felt that it wasn't that kind of film, and I should take those kind of those information things. And actually, it was about people doing the work and that. So the film is really. It took me in a year and a half to edit, and it's really constructed in a way there are. There is lots of information in there, but it's kind of, you know, sometimes there are dates given, but the, the way the sounds work, or for instance, the um, sound is really important. At one point, the brothers talk about that they say there were no quarries in my grandfather's <coughs> time, and you hear the sound of a fighter jet plane coming over. Mm -hmm. So all of these things start to kind of work to say, okay, you know, w you know what is, how historically do, does this material landscape kind of, how does it kind of evolve? But there is, it does ask the viewer, uh, very interestingly, the viewer as a reference, you know, not giving them lots of information. Actually, they need to do some work and they need to then, hopefully, if they're moved by the film, they go away and go, I really want to find out more about what's going on in this region. You know, I don't feel that's my role as a kind of, you know, in the talk, I'm happy to do that when I'm teaching. But actually, I think the work speaks much more about trying to create an intimacy between. The, the characters who, you know, I mean, Ramsey, for instance, was in the PLO, he was imprisoned, you know, and so he's got this really heavy history, but actually he's this extraordinarily charismatic and very melancholic character that I think you can't help be drawn to. And so I'm interested in the kind of, you know, the nuances of those relationships and how we feel. And Israeli friends of mine, um, who saw it, who, you know, were kind of, were kind of very surprised in themselves, moved by it. They said that it didn't preach, but it had this, sense of humanity which made them feel mm. you know they wanted to then kind of think about their own positioning so I suppose yeah can I just add to that that I think that's in a way really important to not over contextualize mm. I think at least as a strategy because because of how sort of divide divisive the language is and I think um, and I think that maybe helps to to kind of extend a bit more for people to feel moved by uh, something like that before I think mm. they mm. Um, yeah. Project. Yeah, um, which obviously doesn't work. So I'm thinking about Janan's work. I mean, you know, you don't give a huge amount of context in your work. It won't mess us at all. And so you're asking us to stay with the work and to start to, to think. Yeah, I'm putting it together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was very interested to hear you say that the word occupation was banned, the use of it was banned mm -hmm. or disallowed. It's it's not Banned, it's barred. So, for example, our organization like Breaking the Silence are not allowed uh, in schools, for example, yeah. or are um, barred from institutions that, um, from galleries, for example, if they're sponsored by the uh, municipalities. Um, and, and so, it's something that happens kind of in practice, basically, that that word becomes. Just, it just drops. Um, and in schools, yeah, I, I mean, I grew up in Jerusalem and I don't recall ever hearing about the occupation, and I, I think I tried to to present today by s highlighting, I think, this process that, in a way, um, encountering this history, the conflict, is a form of unlearning that you have to sort of really unpack what it is that you're seeing and the kind of layers of erasures that sort of um, that are very visible, but 
but they're left unseen in many ways. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, it's very, it, I mean, it's extraordinary having been to the occupied West Bank through Israel, mm -hmm. this kind of, yeah. uh, the difference between these two contexts mm -hmm. and that they're literally side by side. Yes. And, and of course, the Palestinians are fully aware of Israeli mm -hmm. presence and the Israelis are completely oblivious pretty much yes. to the Palestinian situation. It's and that complete disappearance of an entire population is really extraordinary. So what Judy's describing is being able to enter this space as somebody that wouldn't normally enter. And when you enter the West Bank, I mean, as an Israeli, you know, there are all these extraordinary signs saying you're going to be shot, you'll be killed, you'll be kidnapped, you'll be... Yeah. I can't quite remember yeah, exactly. Most Israelis say yeah, they won't go. Yeah, most Israelis don't go. They don't, because they, don't, they, they, they think they'd be arrested. I, remember, I think um, they yeah. also don't want to encounter this mm. in a way. But yes, fear um, definitely mm. plays a role. So I think, I think in many Israelis feel uh, they only hear about the, um, the attacks, the um, terror attacks, etc. And so people are fearful. So I think that also creates a situation whereby Israelis and Palestinians don't often meet unless it's through the military, for example. Um, important for this is the notion obviously of privilege because a lot of areas um, in Israel and in the West Bank um, are declared as military zones um, and fire mm -hmm. zones so you always encounter a sign saying that you're not allowed in but the Israelis sort of seem to have the kind of right of passage into these places or somehow kind of feel protected by the presence of the military uh, whereby Palestinians mm -hmm. are not so there's sort of multiple kind of layers that um, Particularly of um, access uh, restrictions and limitations. Mm. Um, and but then there is also like a, I mean there is obviously you know the internet. So if they they just like a lot of people don't want to know. It's much more convenient to ignore what's happening on the other side of the wall. But then there's also like a lot of things that go on. <coughs> You know, with people, you know, helping, um, like associations of Palestinian and Israelis. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, I uh, I heard like of uh, a few health workers were going into Gaza uh, to provide medical care. There's like a lot of things, you know, like happening. But it just doesn't um, get reported on. It does. They never get reported on. No. Unfortunately. It's also the narrative, the national narrative within education, I think that's where I find it most problematic. Yeah. Um, in school, I remember we were sitting in a class and there would be the complete uh, map of Israel. And so I always thought about it, that it has the green line, the ceasefire line that is now also marked by the wall, the separation wall. But it's, you know, from the distance of where a student might sit, you hardly see it, right? It's kind of the complete map, including the Golan Heights, Gaza, um, the West Bank. Um, so this I find really um, troubling, and, mm -hmm. and in fact I think we see the manifestation of that um, today in how people talk about the conflict, or not talk about the conflict, because there's lack of awareness and lack mm -hmm. of, um, the knowledge is there, but Selim, mm -hmm. you know, have a huge archive online, but they're considered extremist radicals. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I think it, what's interesting, I mean, maybe I just want to, to kind of bring in is that, you know, it is not just a Jewish Israeli condition. I mean, if you think, you know, the kind of the Zionism is something throughout the Jewish diaspora, you know, and my aunt is part of that problem, you know, who are kind of funding kind of Israel. But actually also they are the censorship, which is what we've had in the UK over the last few years, where Jeremy Corbyn obviously kind of, you know, has been, you know, kind of can completely pushed out and accused of kind of anti-Semitism. So actually, there's a complete silencing through the kind of mainstream um, Jewish diaspora. And they, and they also think that they are the representatives. So, you know, the kind of left wing, I'm seen as a self-hating Jew. You know, it's sort of, I mean, it's quite extraordinary. So, you know, this, it is the British, but it's, then, it's the diaspora Jews, which also then enforce kind of what gets said and what doesn't. And this has become obviously so... Um, so sensitive, so oversensitive that um, it's becoming really, really difficult to talk about these things. 
Yes, it's very common. <coughs> yeah. But very oh. often you had the biggest critics, like uh, Eric Rouleau of Le Monde, whose actual yeah, real cool. name is Raphael Dewey. Yeah, yeah. You know, who's uh, you know from Cairo, Jewish. And yeah, so there's been always you know very big critics, and now we seem to be in a much more conservative. Uh, you know, and rigid, you know, like a, uh, environment. And I mean, there are like, and, and everything seems to be like, in a way, um, turn into a media battle, you know, sort of like <coughs> all this, you know, point of, uh, you know, trying to go against those uh, normalized, you know, sort of, you know, big narratives. You know, it could be also to do with, you know, Britain and the kind of, colonial history and, and also like Israel and Palestine. Yeah, and as you say, Leslie, this, one, this wonderful kind of complex cosmopolitanism of the, yeah. kind of the Ottoman period is completely lost, mm -hmm. you know, the, the complexity of the communities across the region. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you know, completely being <coughs> remodeled in this like, you know, just like a monolithic you know, Islamic history, which was never, never the case. Well, the, the older generation is very, um, you know, I, I, I was in a very strange situation about 10, 15 years ago where I had curated something with the British Council around the British Mandate and Archives. It's quite problematic, which I won't go into. Um, I wasn't allowed to use the word Nakba, and, you know, it became a bit of a standoff. Um, and... Um, it was kind of really extraordinary, though. So three screenings happened um, in Haifa and Tel Aviv and um, Jerusalem. And m many of the people that came to the screenings, they had this terrible nostalgia for, you know, pre-48, when obviously Palestinians and Jews were living together. Mm. And, you know, you could travel everywhere. You know, you had mixed football teams. And so, you know, absolutely. And I think... I think it's still something that I struggle to understand, the context of <coughs> Israel is so related to the kind of wider geopolitics and what happened with you know, Russia and communism and the immigration of many Russian Jews to Israel, which really changed the kind of political leanings. Um, you know, and then you, know, you spoke about also kind of how the Sephardi community, you know, who are still much less, um, have much less voice in Israel. So, I mean, the complexities internally in Israel are just which is something I don't feel versed to speak about, but I know, which is why, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's very complex, actually, isn't it? It's an extremely fragmented and mm. um, conflicted society yeah. within its own. Yeah, definitely. Yes. The Arab Jews, I mean, the Jews who immigrated there from places like Morocco and Tunisia felt discriminated against because, and uh, now I think it has changed. But, uh, but for example, uh, they had a thing, um, you know, called uh, something like Saka King, you know, which is like, uh, you know, people with knives, you know, and that well, kind of thing. Right, then, yeah, and, and um, <coughs> yeah, so it's, it's quite, it's a very, you know, a complex, uh, <laughs> you know, landscape. Thank you so much for the need to <laughs> from the, the need to create a kind of a unified identity and that is in itself a very kind of forceful uh, retelling of yeah. history mm -hmm. and so things like an Arab identity do not fit yeah. in that because then we, uh, we're, we Israelis right, uh, yeah. are uh, in the Middle East um, I think Israel tries to set, set itself apart from its neighbours um, and, and that's the cause of and we also talked about that yesterday. We were talking about also how, you know, there was a kind of real kind of push for us all to kind of, um, in terms of how the kind of body is kind of perceived, you know, Jews that came from the ghetto that were kind of very religious and very small and maybe kind of hunched and educated. There was a kind of move to this kind of, you know, you know to being strong and kind of very athletic. And, you know, that's all kind of caught up with... There's lots of propaganda films about, you know, the warrior, Kibitznik. But in a way... This machoism, which also exists within Israel, is also part of that legacy. So other things have emerged through this counter to do with how they obviously felt discriminated against in parts of Europe and then trying to reconfigure their identities, but actually also oppressing their histories and identities. So, for instance, Yiddish was banned um, when Israel was first formed. And that is, for me, that's for my family, from the Lithuanian Jews, that's the history of the Jewish people over hundreds of years. Mm. And if you take that language away, 
what do you have? So it's it's really how the legacy of um, the Holocaust is that you <coughs> have the Israel, I think, has mm. made a bit, huge impact um, on this. Um, yeah, and sort of being um, subjected to such annihilation plays mm. out in, in mm. very strong, forceful ways. Um, I think mm. it filters into mm. that Israeli um, mm. psyche. Yeah. I'm really sorry to be that person, <laughs> <laughs> but it's very important conversation, and, and thank you uh, for agreeing to do it together, actually, with the three voices. I think it's very important. And thank you. Uh, <laughs>